Okay, we have CRT test practice 1 through 11 for April 8, 2013. All right, the decimal form of each four different numbers contains an infinite number of digits, it means it goes on forever. Stacy writes only the first seven digits of each number without rounding. Which of these numbers is most likely to be irrational? We know that a rational number is defined as a number that can be written as a fraction. As a decimal, it either repeats or it terminates, so it doesn't continue to go on. So we're going to find which ones are rational, and then the one that's left will be irrational. So we have A, which has 4.090909. Well, we know that the 09 repeats over and over again. So that's a repeating number. That's rational. 4.125000. We know from previous learning that we don't need those zeros. So that means that our number terminated at 4.125, so that's rational. We have C, which is 4.22222, so we know the 2 repeats, so that makes that rational, which leaves us D, 4.898979. We don't know if that repeats, but remember our question said most likely irrational, so letter D then would seem to be the one. Number 2, look at the value shown below. Pi squared, the square root of 38. 99 sevenths and 3 times the square root of 15. So to put these in order from greatest to least we have to make them all the same. So pi squared is about 3.14 squared. So 3.14 squared means let's round it to 3 squared which means that would give us 9. The square root of 38 we know is very close to the square root of 36 which is 6 so we know this is a little bit more. So let's say 6.2 or so. 99 sevenths, let's change to a number that we can deal with, a mixed number. So 7 goes into 99, that's going to go in there once, 14, and about 1 seventh. And then 3 times the square root of 15. Well, the square root of 15 is very close to the square root of 16, which is 4. So 3 times 4 is about 12, so we can estimate. So there's our four numbers that we can deal with now. We want greatest to least. So the largest number is right here, 14 and 1 seventh, which is 99 sevenths, which is A or B. So C and D are gone. Okay, the next largest number would be the 12, which we know is 3 times the square root of 15, which gives us this right there, not the square root of 38, so that one's gone. So our answer is B, by the process of elimination. C, what is the cubed root of 216? We know cubed root means what number times itself times itself again is a 216. Well, look at your answers. If I even take the 24, and let's say round it to 20, 20 times 20, we know is going to be at least 400, so that's way too big. So we know that all of these, if I were to multiply them by themselves again, besides squaring them, would be much too large. So that leaves A. We also know that 6 cubed from our memory is 216. That's one of the numbers that you're supposed to have memorized as the cubed root. Number 4. Which is closest to the sum of 1.128 times 10 to the 8th and 7.282 times 10 to the 7th? So in this particular one, let's bring this down a little bit so you can see it, we got to change these to standard form. We're going to add them and then we'll change it back into scientific notation. So we know 1.128 times 10 to the 8th, we would move that decimal three places, and then we'd have five more zeros to make the eight places that we move. So that would be 1, 1, 2, 8, with five more zeros. Okay, go ahead and put your commas. So that's 112,800,000. Okay, if we do the same thing to the other one, we're going to move it over three places, and then that would leave seven more or four more zeros to make up that exponent of seven. So that's going to be seven two eight two with four zeros. So if we write that here with four zeros and put our commas, that's seventy two million eight hundred twenty thousand. So now we have to subtract. So we have to line up the place values. Okay, and then I guess add, not subtract. That's 0, 0, 0, 0, 2, 16, carry the 1, 5, 8, 1, put your commas in. So that's 185,620,000. So 
So now let's change that back into scientific notation. We know we put the decimal between the first two digits, so it's going to be 1.8562 times 10 to something. Well, if this is where our decimal was, and this is where we put it, how many jumps would it take to get it back? 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8. So that's times 10 to the 8th, which means these two aren't possible. And obviously 1.8562 is closest to 1.86 times 10 to the 8th. Okay, look at the equation below. All right, oof, looks kind of hard. Well, the first thing we're going to do is we have learned how to get rid of fractions in our equations. So let's do that first before we go through our solving equation steps. Okay, I'm going to change that 4.5 to an improper fraction to make it easier. So remember how you do that? You multiply there and add there, so that's 9 halves. So what makes our fractions? It's the 2 as the denominator. So to get rid of the denominator, we just multiply the whole thing by that number. So I'm going to multiply this side by 2 to get rid of that 2 there. And I have to multiply this side by 2 then. So now 2 times 10y is 20y minus, well that 2 divided by that 2 is 1. So 3 times that 1 is 3 in their y's. And then 2 times the 8 is 16. Now do the same thing the other side. 2 times 7 is 14. 2 times 6y is 12y. Okay, 2 divided by the 2 is 1, so 9 times 1 is 9. There, fraction's gone. Let's do our same change switch, same change switch. Okay, distributive property, nope. Combine like terms, yes. I can combine 20y and negative 3y to get 17y plus 16. I can combine 14 and negative 9 to get 5 plus, oh, that was 12y. Okay. Okay, next step, do I have variables on both sides? I sure do. So let's move this 12y over to the left by doing the opposite, which is negative 12y. You guys should be proficient at this. So that cancels, so I'm left with 5y plus 16 equals 5, and there's a two-step equation. So opposite of the number, so I'm left with 5y equals negative, what, 11? Divide each side by 5. So I get y equals negative 11 fifths, but notice our answers are in mixed number form, so we have to change them back. So that's going to be negative. 5 goes to 11 twice. There's a 1 left over. So negative 2 and 1 fifth. And that's letter D. Okay, number 6. Which equation does not describe a linear function? Well, right off the bat, the easiest thing to look for is exponents, and we see that letter B has an exponent there. So that's a quadratic equation, so it won't make a straight line. So A, C, and D will, because I can write them in uh, slope-intercept form, but B I can't, so that's the one they wanted. Okay, 7. Uh, that polygon is shown on the coordinate below, and it's a dilation. So... It asks us in our question, the location of vertex M after the dilation is negative 8, 6. So let's plot that. So negative 8 and up 6 would be right here. So obviously I'm making it smaller. Now, we're at negative 8, 6 now. Where was M to begin with? It was at negative 16, positive 12. So we can look at the actual coordinates to see what happened. So what happened to go from here to there? Look at what the numbers do. Okay, it's negative 16 and negative 8. Well, it looks like I divided by 2. Did I do the same thing with the 12 to the 6? Sure. So that's what we'll do with our next point, n. Point n right here is 8, 10. So we know that we're going to divide it in half. So when I divide it in half and make it smaller, it's going to be 4, 5, and that's letter C. So I can use my coordinates to determine what my scale was. That new dilation is half the size of the original. Okay, next one. Let's move it down so you can see it. Jenny used three squares to make a design. She labeled each square with its area. Jenny drew the square so that the triangle ABC was formed, as shown in the diagram below. Right off the bat, when you look at that, you should be thinking Pythagorean Theorem. So then it goes on to say, if Jenny uses the converse 
of the Pythagorean theorem to write a statement about triangle ABC, which statement could Jenny have written? Well, you guys can read through all this, but what I would simply point out is we know that in our converse, the area of the square coming off one leg added to the area of the square coming off the second leg will give you the area of the square coming off the hypotenuse. So we're definitely talking about area. So let's see which one does that. Okay, this just says the sum of the lengths of the sides. That's not area, so that's not right. Okay, the sum of the area of the square with side AC. Well, let's make sure that's a leg. So that's right here. Okay, and the area of the square with side CB, so that's our other leg, is equal to the area of the square with side AB, which is our third one, and that matches what we just said. This square added to this square equals that square, and the main point is it has to be the area. So our answer is B. Okay, number nine. The rectangle prism is shown in the diagram below. And that says, what is the length of the line segment that extends between vertex K and vertex R? So this dark black line. We did this as one of our unit tests um, constructed response. And we have a nice, easy shortcut. When I have a, like a box like that, a rectangular prism, if I take and square all of the lengths, the height, and add it to the square of the length, and add it to the square of the width. That's going to be the area of that long diagonal, okay, right there. So now if we go ahead and add all these, I got 81 plus, use your calculator, 32 times 32 equals 1,024. And 24 times 24, I know, is 576. That's going to equal the square of that. So if we add all those up, I get 1681. And that equals this squared. Remember how we get rid of a square? We do the square root. Square root. So that cancels these because they're opposite. So now I'm left with x, which would be the length, equals the square root of 1681. And so then down here, obviously it's not that one or that one. So it's either 40 or 41. Well, 40 squared is 40 times 40 is 1,600. So 41 times 41 has to be it, and that actually is our 1,681. So that's going to be C. So that's a, a quick, easy shortcut. Okay, number 10. The locations of point A and point B in a coordinate plane are described by the ordered pairs listed below. What is the shortest distance between point A and point B? So when we did this, we made a coordinate plane. We plotted our points, and then we used the Pythagorean theorem. So we're going to do that here. So 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. And the same down here. Let's plot the points. So negative 3, 5 right there, and then 2, negative 1 right there. So now if we connect them, that's going to be our hypotenuse. So let's go ahead and make the rest of our right triangle. So I'm going to go over to here, and then up to there. So now figure out your distances for the legs. Well, here is 1, and then I went up 5. So this whole distance right here would be 6. Okay, here I went over 1, and I went over 3, so this whole distance right here is going to be 4. So now you use your Pythagorean theorem. a squared plus b squared is going to equal our c squared, which is that distance. So 6 squared plus 4 squared equals c squared. 36 plus 16 equals c squared. So that's 52 equals c squared, and we just learned the last problem, how to get rid of the squared. We do the square root which cancels these. So our hypotenuse is going to be the square root of 52, which they don't have. So let me double check my math in my distances. Oh, I made a mistake right here. This point right there 
should have been over negative 2 or positive 2, 1. So it was right there. So that's the nice thing about multiple choice is it gives us answers. And if our answers aren't there, we got to go back. So this one would be a little bit longer. So that's because I, I didn't pay attention to my points. So this was 2 right there, and this is 3. So this distance right here should have been 5. You guessed it. So now if I go back up and change things, that's 5 squared, so that's going to be 25. 36 and 25 is 61. So C is the square root of 61, which we do have that answer. Okay? So if you get it wrong, don't just guess. Go back and see where you made your mistake. Okay, number 11, we're going to actually do in class. Okay, but you should know how to find the volume of a sphere. Well, this is half a sphere, right? Okay, so once you find the volume of the sphere, then you can use the equation for the volume of a cylinder, plug in those numbers from up here, and get the height. So remember the two formulas, volume of a sphere was 2 thirds pi r squared times height, and the volume for a cylinder was simply pi r squared times height. So you work on that, and then we'll work on it more in class as well. Okay, good luck.